uh, along with uh, many other places and people all across this country and in other countries as well. Uh, as you all know, we may soon be in a war that is not of our choosing and something that uh, many of us oppose. Uh, Sam Hamill, uh, who is uh, a very well-known poet and the founder of a very highly regarded small press called Copper Canyon Press and friends to some of us here, uh, instead of going to Laura Bush's party, decided to launch a movement of poets against the war, which uh, soon caught on and more than 12,000 people actually have written and submitted their poems. And today, uh, 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 those poems will be submitted, uh, which will be the largest ever anthology of poems for peace and against war. Uh, my name is Haider Khan. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I teach here at GSIS. Uh, and uh, we have uh, here many of the GSIS students, but also people from outside. We have our former dean and professor, Thomas Rowe, here. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, those students you know, who helped in organizing this and staff, uh, especially Susan Rivera and Jeanette King. Uh, as well as uh, many others. Uh, uh, I won't be able to thank everybody by name, but without all their help, even this little event would not have been possible. Now, we have already a uh, very enthusiastic response from many people to whom we sent out the announcement for this event. So we have a list of people who want to read. Uh, but uh, also, after these people are done, we will have uh, an open mic. So if you want to read, then please uh, just hang around, and when the time comes, just step forward and say your piece or your point. Uh, we are going to begin uh, with uh, a piece. Oh, before we begin, I should announce a very important thing. It has to do with economics. And I have to confess, I, I'm a trained economist. I keep forgetting that fact. Uh, but uh, when we asked uh, the university for a microphone, they said that they would have to charge us because, you know, they found uh, the Finance is in control of every modern, complex organization, such as universities. So in order to comply with them and also uh, 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 make sure that we can raise some funds, we have uh, done two things. First of all, uh, many of the poems that will be read today are in this small anthology called Flowers of Fire. And uh, uh, this has been put together by people here at GSIS. Uh, I thank them again. And there are people at the table over there. And for $2 or more, if you so desire, you can get one copy of this. So this is for the war that is yet to be and we hope is not to be. And then there is another anthology which uh, was compiled during the last Gulf War. <laughs> and that one is also there. And that's for $1 or more. I hope uh, you will get some of them, uh, enough of them, so that we can at least uh, uh, pay for these microphones. Uh, thank you, and now we will begin. Uh, the first piece we want to begin with is actually by uh, uh, Paul Robson. Uh, many of you know about Paul Robson. Uh, he, in my view, and many other people's view, uh, uh, is an all-time great American and a great citizen of the world. Uh, I was surprised that I grew up singing many of his songs uh, in Bengali, which is my native language, uh, in South Asia. But when I came to America, many people didn't know who Paul Robson was. And <laughs> then I found out that because of his, of his past of resistance, uh, he became a persona non grata in his own country, more or less. Uh, in the 50s, uh, this may interest you, his passport was taken away. And uh, he still resisted and sang over telephone. And his people in Europe uh, and other places could hear him sing still. Uh, uh, but this uh, particular song, I think, is very appropriate at this moment. Uh, and the lyrics, by the way, are in that anthology, Flowers of Fire. Uh, this is called, What is America to Me? And I think all of us really uh, already are reflecting on this, and, and I think there are other people who should. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just play. A 
Speaking of America, I think uh, we uh, know who the first people on this continent were, and we are fortunate uh, that we have at least uh, two uh, uh, readings that are related to the first people on this uh, land. Uh, is Loring Bush, is Loring Abeda here? Oh, there she is. Okay, so you can begin. So Loring is going to uh, read something, first a statement and then a poem. And uh, both of them again are in that anthology. So I'll ask her to come forward and read those. Thank you, Hyder. Thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this today. This um, seems like a really important event. and. Um, as a real old timer at GSIS, it's really nice to be here and see new faces and, um, and participate in this um, really important poetry reading. The first selection that I have um, is written by Oren Lyons uh, of the Onondaga Nation, and it's called Traditional Native Perspectives. And, um, and I will just go ahead and read it. I think it pertains and is an eloquent comment on the poem that I will read as my second selection. <clears throat> the great creator planted life on, upon the earth. He gave instructions to the great nations of life, from the grasses to the whales. For us, the human beings, he gave additional responsibilities. He gave us hands to work with. He gave us intellect and the power of reason. He gave us options to choose our paths, to do right or to do wrong. He gave us the foreknowledge of death and he gave us the insight to life after death. These are responsibilities more than gifts. And he gave each of us a mission in this life that is ours alone. And these are responsibilities to be cherished and to be shared for the benefit of all life. From where we come from, the natural law is simple in this case. We will suffer in exact ratio to our transgressions and the damage done may be permanent to life as we know it today. Here we are at this point in history with a task that we cannot leave to our children. 
Take heed to the words of our grandfathers, who instructed us to take care how you place your moccasins upon the earth. Step with great care, they said, for the faces of the future generations are looking up from the earth, waiting their turn for life. Again, I think that's an eloquent comment on this next poem that I'll read. This poem is written by Greg Kosminski, and he is with the uh, Nebraskans for Peace, and it appeared in a volume of his titled, When There Wasn't Any War. And the title of the poem is Giving Mark a Bath. And it's just a very simple, everyday kind of image that he evokes. What I think is very powerful about this poem and what I think that uh, Oren Lyon's commentary helps us to reflect on in this poem is that this poem is written from a very um, isolated, sheltered, American suburban perspective. I call it suburban ennui. Um, kind of that, you know, taking for granted our safety, our security, and forgetting uh, how many other peoples we have threatened and terrorized with our own policies. And in this poem, the image of that um, becomes very clear, that uh, in a way, as Oren Lyons wrote, um, we will suffer an exact ratio to our transgressions, the damage done. So this is Giving Mark a Bath by Greg Kosmicki. <clears throat> he asks, where does the wizard live? Are there bad wolves around here? No, no, these things they make up to scare little boys. They aren't real. Gets out of the tub, slender, not quite four, blonde, skinny, pretty, shiny, wonderful eyes. I wrap the towel around his shoulders. Then I see it is him running down the streets naked, no place to hide, terror, the missiles dropping. I am nowhere, no help. She who knew everything, who had all the answers. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. We are also very fortunate to have uh, in our midst today uh, Professor Tink Tinker from the Eilif School of Theology. Uh, those of you who have read Tink's writings or have attended his sermons uh, or his uh, uh, speeches uh, know uh, that he speaks with both passion and reason, and both his passions and his reasons run deep. So without further ado, I will invite Ting to come and read. Thank you, Heider. I'm an old sage from the Wajaja Nation. I speak pretty good English without an accent, but you need to know I come from a country that is surrounded by the United States, surrounded by Oklahoma and Kansas, pretty much in the middle. I'm also what's called an American Indian mixed blood, which means that uh, only one of my parents was Indian. I'm also a man, even though one of my parents was a woman. <laughs> my people are survivors of a long history of US preemptive war making. So we shouldn't think that this moment is somehow new in the history of the United States as we begin to threaten seriously the Iraqi peoples. I'm going to read a poem by Wendy Rose, a Hopi woman, titled, A $3,000 Death Song. <clears throat> she prefaces her poem with this news item, 19 American Indian skeletons from Nevada, valued at $3,000. Museum Invoice, 1975. <clears throat> Is it in cold hard cash? The kind that dusts the insides of men's pockets lying silver polished surface along the cloth? Or in bills 
papering the wallets of they who threaten the night with dark words, or checks. Paper promises weighing the same as words spoken once on the other side of the grown grass and damned rivers of history. However it goes, it goes. Through my body it goes, assessing each nerve, running its edges along my arteries, planning ahead for whose hands will rip me into pieces of dusty red paper, whose hands will smooth or smatter me into traces of rubble. Invoiced now. It's official how our bones are valued that stretch out pointing to sunrise or are flexed into one last fetal bend that are removed and tossed about, cataloged, numbered with black ink on newly white foreheads as we were formed to the white soldier's voice, so we explode under white students' hands. Death is a long trail of days in our fleshless prison. From this distant point, we watch our bones auctioned with our careful beadwork, our quilled medicine bundles, even the bridles of our shot down horses. You who have priced us, you who have removed us at what cost? What price the pits where our bones share a single bit of memory? How one century turns our dead into specimens, our history into dust, our survivors into clowns. Our memory must be catching, you know. Picture the mortars, the arrowheads, the labrets shaking off their labels like Bears suddenly awake to find the seasons have ended while they slept. Watch them touch each other, measure reality, march out the museum door. Watch as they lift their faces and smell about for us. Watch our bones rise to meet them and mount the horses once again. The cost then will be paid for our sweet grass smelling having been in clamshell beads, in steatite, dentalia, and woodpecker scalp, turquoise and copper, blood and oil, coal and uranium, children, a universe of stolen things. Thank you, Tink. One of the really inspiring things about poetry, and perhaps all art, really, is that uh, uh, perhaps uh, the English poet uh, uh, Shelley uh, said his best uh, when he said that our sweetest songs are those that tell us of saddest thoughts. So uh, even as we feel deep sorrow, we can still see the beauty of life and beauty of life reflected in our poems and our music and our painting. Well, I'm really happy to introduce our next reader, Ricky Ducournay. Uh, it is hard to describe her many talents. She's not just a poet, she's also a novelist. Uh, uh, she is uh, not just a novelist, uh, uh, if I may say so, her whole life really is an art. So uh, she is the kind of person who really brings art and the meaning of art and the meaning of beauty alive for us. Uh, just this morning, I tried to see how many books of her our poor library had, and I already counted more than 10. And she is still active. In fact, she is going to read from her novel in progress uh, for us this afternoon. So please welcome Ricky Ducorne. I lived in Algeria after its war for independence. I was there for two years. Peace was signed in March of uh, 1962, and this novel has been a long time coming, as you can see. I thought I would simply read three pages. Um, simply what you need to know is the central character, the narrator, is a professor of geology, works at the Sorbonne, 
and his best student, an Algerian named Zadur, was arrested by the Parisian police and tortured and disappeared. And now what the professor must do is find a way of reaching his family, which is very, very difficult. He's also unsure exactly as how Zadur was, was killed, but he knows that he was tortured. Or perhaps he had drowned in the Seine, beaten, his arms broken, then thrown. Such things happen in Paris. Always when his body hits the water, I am awakened by the sound. But first, there is silence, the silence of a stone buried deep in the ground beneath a bigger stone, and I am falling with him. The bones of my face pummeled into chalk, I fall through the air. The water quivers with the lights of Paris, it quivers with the contagion that a The river is purple, a swift glacier, corrosive, cold. It folds over us, it swallows us whole. It closes above us with the sound of a door slammed shut in a sudden wind. The house empty, the sound leaping from room to room, bouncing off the walls like a madman or a caged orangutan. And I awaken in the middle of the night, the bones of my face burning and my heart sawing its way through my ribs in a circle. Needless to say, I do not sleep well and cannot eat a meal without thinking of sacrifice. Of a youth drowned in a sacred spring or surrounded or surrendered to a bog of blue clay. Of the 300 boys, Aristomenes gave up to Zeus and Achilles' blood gift of 12 Trojans. To convince myself that a bucket of water, a filthy hose, a river of ice can be evoked in the same breath as the two-faced axes of the gods. You are merely eating bread, I scold myself, a bit of stale baguette dunked in a warm bowl of chicory, my face plunged into a book all the while as I try to outwit the moment when I cannot suppress a sob.